I can't even begin to describe to you the excitement when, um, oh my God, it's a phone call from, from West Berlin. My mother, I mean, she, she would just, she was always, always in tears afterwards because she always wanted out. She always wanted out. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss a single episode. A young Claudia Beershank lived in a village surrounded by hills, valleys and thick forests at the edge of a world called the GDR. It could be beautiful, but the Iron Curtain runs through it like a tectonic plate separating East and West and Claudia from her West German relatives. She tells of her life in this isolated area, a village life far away from the socialist showpiece of East Berlin, where there's only two types of yoghurt in the village store. In a series of snapshots, we relive her childhood of secretly watching West German TV, learning Marxism-Leninism for kids at school, and the rare joy of a phone call from the West. We also hear of her parents' challenges, for her father, it's his home village, but he's criticised for his liberal views and for wearing Western braces to school. Her mother is seen by locals as an outsider, and she yearns for a life in the West with her sister in West Berlin. Claudia has distilled these stories into a book called Never Mind Comrade, published by Tangerine Press. There's links in the episode notes where you can purchase the book and support the podcast. Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will keep this project going and allow me to continue preserving these incredible stories. You'll join our community, get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Claudia Beershank to our Cold War conversation. I was born actually outside of East Berlin in a town called Uranienburg, which uh, it's also in the book. It just so happens to uh, have had the largest uh, Soviet military airport outside of Russia, or so they said. And uh, when I was still a baby, my parents moved uh, to to Ringia, which is when you look at well at a map of the two Germanys next to each other, back during East German times, it would have been the southwest corner. So the current map of Germany would be right in the middle now, right at the center. So it was really very close to the... Um, to the border to West Germany. I was born in 1976. Uh, so when the wall came down or the Iron Curtain came down, I was just about just two months away from my 14th birthday. I still got my, um, my East German passport. So I still have that and my traveling passport. <laughs> so we had one passport, which is like an ID card. You got that when you turned 14 and then you could at the same time apply for a Reisepass or a traveling passport. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. That's a great, great souvenir. Yeah, that. It is. Wow. It's still, it's still wow. as good as new, obviously. There's not, not a stamp <laughs> in it. <laughs> God, that's incredible. Why did your parents decide to move to Thuringia? Oh, that was just uh, purely practical reasons. So my mother is from... Uh, from this town, Oranienburg, uh, near East Berlin. And my father is from Thuringia. And um, as it was, uh, so they were both living here near East Berlin at the time. But it was incredibly difficult to find a flat in East Germany. I mean, you could get flats, but they were mostly in a really bad condition or you had to wait for a while. So they were living um, with my grandmother. And that, of course, didn't it didn't go so well, you know, after a while. So my father, his parental home was in Thuringia. It was a big house. Uh, his parents lived there and they had a whole floor free. So they just decided to move there because, you know, there was space and out in the country. Um, so that was the reason. But it was 
very, very close to the border. And it was very difficult for my mother uh, to move there. Um, it's, uh, I have to go to the book a bit. If you, if you look, if you read the stories, you will find that it wasn't just the border that was a problem, but it was also the small town community, uh, this kind of added layers. Uh, you had this very small community, very, um, enclosed, you know, they didn't like outsiders, which I mean, is a universal thing, I guess. Um, and then you also had, funnily enough, um, pressure from the church, which, although it being East Germany, where the church uh, wasn't really liked, uh, but not banned, uh, the church was very strong in that region, the Catholic church. Well, small town, it's sort of everybody knows your yes. business as yes. well, don't they? So it's not the anonymity of a of a big city or a, or a bigger exactly. town. Exactly. And what what did your parents do for a living? So my mother, she was a potter. She did pottery. I worked in a big uh, kind of pottery uh, manufacturing, I don't know what you call it in English, ma manufacturers um, near East Berlin. And my father was a school teacher. Uh, so there was a school uh, in the local village and he was teaching German and physical education. And my mother, she built up her own little... Um, pottery business which um was possible in east germany so you actually there was no private business as such because it was a socialist state you know so everything belonged to everybody but under certain circumstances you could have your own business so she was there you know doing her pottery selling it on markets or you know taking orders from restaurants who wanted a pottery for their uh you know crockery as such yeah, so they had, they had fairly okay jobs. What, what were your neighbors? Ah, the neighbors. Like? <laughs> so, the neighbors. So <laughs> I think we were all related somehow. <laughs> it was it's all, um, all the close neighbors were, uh, more distant or closer relations to my grandparents and, um, well, first and foremost, uh, I mean, again, this is something probably very universal, you know, quite nosy, very closely knit, uh, um, net, uh, social net there. And, um, yeah, uh, it's, it, I have to, so I have to explain a little bit about this area where I live. It's, um, it's in the state of Thuringia, of Thüringen, but this little enclave, I want to call it this little Catholic enclave, um, was always a little bit special. I, I'm not sure what I could compare it to. Um, but they are very closely knit, very close family ties, very religious. Um, and there's a great stubbornness in this community also against, uh, th there was a great stubbornness against the East German government. I wouldn't say they weren't really strict followers or running with the pack, so to say. And the neighbors, well, they always had their eyes on my mother, of course, you know, because she was the outsider. My mother is, she still is the outsider after 40 years. It's, uh, uh 46 years, sorry. Uh, <laughs> always looking, you know, always looking behind the curtain. And especially, um, whenever West German relatives came to visit, because we lived so close to the border so that many families were separated. So th there was nobody in the village who didn't have relatives in West Germany, which was technically only five kilometers away. There was, I think there was a couple of teachers, uh, very strict communists who had no ties to the West, possibly the priest, I don't know, but very few people that had no ties to the West. But whenever a, a Western car would come driving up the road, you could, you could see all the curtains move, you know, or anything else, you know, the curtains would move. And my mother always said, oh, um, Claudia, come, come, come inside or, um, you know, the, the windows are eyes. <laughs> so, so very nosy neighbors. Yeah. When you were at home, were you told about things not to say outside in, in public or w with people who you didn't necessarily yeah. know? Um, so I have, no, I have to say it's, it's, it's it might sound strange, but somehow, um, my parents didn't even have to say that um, because 
you just knew it, it, it um I mean, my, my father, he complained an awful lot about the government. Uh, I mean, I have to also say that in this area where, where we lived, it, it was, it just was very poor. I mean, when you, whenever you went to East Berlin, um, it was fascinating because they had so much stuff in the shops, but, uh, in our tiny little village shop, it was, um, I mean, there was, let's just say we didn't, we weren't hungry, but it was just a very, very limited and very monotonous offer of things. And whenever there was something special, uh, you had to run for it to get it, and it was rationed. And um, but, but I kind of knew already from kindergarten onwards that we spoke one language at home and one language on the street. Uh, and occasionally, whenever um, my parents were talking amongst each other and I would just happen to, to hear something. Um, they might say, Claudia, no, don't mention this to anyone. And it was clear to me that I wouldn't. I remember in the book, you mentioned that there were only two flavors of yogurt you yes. could get in the local yes. store. Uh, natural yogurt <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, fruit, which which is so, uh, I still remember this. It, it came in bottles, which of course is very sustainable. But I remember precisely that the natural yogurt, you would open the bottle and it would just flow out. And the, the other fruit yogurt, it would, it would fall out of the bottle in big blobs, you know, like, like an alien. Uh, this is all still very present with me, even the taste. Um, I, I have to say, I wrote this book, uh, primarily for my son who was asking me about stories from East Germany and from when I was little. And I, I felt that I could really step back into it. Um, and, and kind of, uh, evoke these moments again and these the smells and what the stuff there was in the shop. Uh, I can actually see that now because it wasn't so much, you know, there's so much that you need to remember. It's it's a lovely book. I mean, I I was enchanted by you you know the prose and the the descriptions that you you used in there. There's some lovely little vignette stories of, and you you can it does feel like you're there. And and I love the way you've just got these little you know these snapshots yeah. in there, and and you can see it through a child's eyes because you're describing it in a way that a child would be trying to make sense. Yeah of yeah. it as well which is which is which is lovely i'm so, glad you're saying um, that thanks well very done much. On that. <laughs> yeah no absolutely um hit the spot with me um the the other thing i think you you, you mentioned is is a you you talked about fruit yogurt but occasionally you'd get some of uh fidel's yes. revenge <laughs> yes you? we would so we were given free school dinners and Occasionally, we would, we would be given, uh, uh these, uh, oranges, uh, green, they were green oranges, and I have never seen them since, uh, since the war came down. And they were just known as Fidel's Revenge or just, uh, Cuba Apfelsin, Cuba oranges, because they were green, they were obviously not ripe. And I remember it, uh, I always brought them home, my mother would put them up on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> they would just lie there and never ever turn orange and just stay that way. And, um, cause they were green and not ripe, you know, people would get the runs from it. Um, so <laughs> hence Fidel's revenge for what I don't know. <laughs> cause I think that there's an interesting story about the, the milk that you, cause you got mm -hmm. free milk yes, at school. You did. And if you didn't finish your milk, you, you, uh, got a black mark on your, in your class book so or something. the whole east german system in all of its aspects was one of belohnung und strafe so punishment and reward uh, and this was also the primary aspect in education and i can say that quite clearly and quite freely um, it was sanctions or rewards so we were constantly um given black dots and black uh, strokes or red dots or red strokes um, for good behavior, for um, tidying your desk, for having all your material. And if you didn't do something according to, you know, how it was expected, you were given a black dot and a black stroke. And it was from very early on this whole system of 
punishment and reward was just uh, imprinted in us. So the milk, yeah, we had to line up. If there was some, if there was a bottle of milk in the casket where there was still a little bit left, then the teacher made us line up. And so whose bottle is this? You're getting this milk for free. You know, all the poor kids in the world, you know, who are not getting milk for free, uh, who didn't drink the milk. And then, you know, it was, I mean, we could always say it's not my milk, but we were so scared a lot of the times, or, or ma many of us were just scared or were so used to obeying that eventually the, the culprit would just pick up the bottle and finish it. You know, that, that's the thing. It's just like when, um, you know, this thing about the analogy with the elephant, you know, you have it tied up for 20 years and then you're letting it loose and it won't go anywhere. It's just this kind of obedience and, uh, you know, whose milk is this? Oh yeah, of course I'll pick it up, you know, instead of just saying, no, it's not mine. But yeah, that's, that's how it worked. Yeah, because we, we used to have, when I was at school, we had free milk, but it was removed by uh, the education minister of the time, yes. Margaret Thatcher, and she was forever known as Maggie Thatcher. Oh, yes, milk I, I Snatcher. read about that. I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, I hated that milk. It was, well, it was, it was you know, God. so much. Yeah. I, I would have struggled yeah. in East Germany. It's I'll like half you. a litre down, you know, it's. Uh, into these small stomachs within a 10 minute break. Yeah. Obviously it, it left an impression with me. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we were touching on shopping a while earlier. Now, I mean, what did you do for, for other stuff like clothes and things like that? I mean, did, were there any, what, what sort of shops were there in this <laughs> village or did you have to go to a bigger town if you um, wanted something else? So we had else? one, kind of grocery shop uh, you could say grocery shop and then we had um, like one shop for stuff of you know that you would need for daily life and there was also a clothes section and shoes but it was just I mean East Germany certainly wasn't known for its fashion you know it was quite um, I mean I so I never ever wore any any my mother she had this thing that she said, I'm never, ever buying you anything, any clothes from the East. So we were lucky enough that my um, my aunt was living in, in West Berlin. So most of our relatives lived in West Berlin or West Germany. And they would regularly just send us parcels with hand-me-down clothes. So I was in the very lucky position that, um, you know, I I could just wear really cool i mean what i thought were really cool clothes uh, from the west later on we found out that uh you know the clothes that they would give us yeah you know for them it was kind of yeah for for the easterners it's still okay you know they can still wear it <laughs> i'm being mean now but um it this this also went around but yeah, so close and all people just did it, you know, just uh, made stuff themselves. I mean, my mother, she did a lot of sewing. Um, shoes, of course, we had, you know, you had to buy shoes, but people were just making stuff themselves or getting it from the West. I mean, the, the amount of parcels that was going through, uh, coming through to East Germany must have been tremendous, tremendously high. You, you mentioned the you know, your teachers were not from the area and they were strictly communist. I mean, did they take a dim view of you wearing Western clothes or so or the, not? Some of, the, some of the teachers were from further away um, and had no relatives in the West, but some teachers also were local and, you know, you know each other. And, well, for them, it was... So you could wear clothes from the West, of course. What you could not wear was anything that would say USA on it or, uh, I don't know, can I say this now, Coca-Cola? Or you can edit it out. Um, <laughs> so anything that Mickey Mouse, I, I know I once wore a Mickey Mouse um, T-shirt. And, well, there was one particularly strict teacher. Uh, he was kind of like... Um, equivalent to social science uh, teacher, but in East Germany it was called um, Staatsbürgerkunde, citizens' education. 
which was basically kind of Marxism, Leninism for kids, um, for, for school children. <laughs> that sounds like a fun lesson, that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, that's funny. So he, and he said to me that uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, that's from the USA, go home and get changed. So that, that happened. But then other teachers were very relaxed. I mean, my father, he would never, ever send anyone home. My father, uh, he went to school with, um, uh, one, one time in a parcel, there was, was some, uh, what do you call these suspenders? No. What, you know, that br uh, braces? braces? Yeah. Braces or dungarees. Well, uh, was braces. Or braces. Well, hold, yeah, to hold exactly. the trousers up oh, braces, that go okay. over them. Yeah. Uh, and they, yeah. they were clearly, it was the American flag. So I don't I have, I can't even remember who sent this to him. And he wore these to school and is like, yeah, it looks like the Cuban flag. What do I know? And he did get a warning. He did get called into the, um, headmaster's office. And, you know, uh, Comrade Bierschenk, uh, no, he wasn't even a comrade, but uh, at the time, you know, they would say, Comrade Bierschenk, uh, what's this? What's the meaning of these braces? I don't know. I, I, I needed them. I need them. Should my pants fall down? Yeah. So it was, you know, there were teachers who were more relaxed. There were teachers who were stricter, who put the fear of the state in us, uh, not so much of God. And, um, yeah, I guess if you'd worn a Vita Cola yeah, T shirt Vita you would have been yeah. all right. But there was there was no uh PR or no <laughs> no uh, advertisement. <laughs> so in East Berlin you could sometimes see like uh oh god, what was it? Peas, temple peas. They're really good. <laughs> Something like that. Really <laughs> stupid. Um but that was only in really big cities. Uh you would occasionally see something that would really, you know kind of rudimentary remind you of uh, advertisement and and at school what what did the what did they tell you about the border what what how did they describe it to you and the reasons as to why it was so there? the border was of course um it was the, the the state border it was the official state border of the gdr it was supposed to protect us so I have to say that for this, this topic would only come up quite late, uh, when you, uh, when we first started having this, uh, Marxism Leninism for school kids, uh, that was in sixth or seventh, seventh grade. And, um, this is when we would actually clearly uh, talk about, you know, talk about the subject of the border. And it was always well defined that it was, um, uh, like a protective measure. It was a first, first and foremost, it was, the official border line, like every country has. And then it was, of course, there to protect us. And for the wall, that was always called the anti-fascist um, protection wall. You know, so it's it was there to, to keep the evil ones out and to keep us safe. But, of course, we knew there was complete and utter, can I say, bullshit on the show? You can. We, we knew and we intrinsically knew this. I mean, we, um, because like I said, most of us had relatives in the West and, uh, they were supposed to be our class enemy, but I mean, they were like auntie and uncle. They came over and they brought us cool stuff and they were happy to leave again. So, you know, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. So, that, so yeah, they made it clear that, you know, this is what it is and it's there to protect us and, you know, it's always going to be there. Watching TV. Tricky subject, yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly why I want to get into it. So tell me about about watching TV and uh, also what you did when the doorbell yeah. went. So, yeah, television, that was our window to the world, you know, as sad as that sounds. But uh, because we lived so close to the border, uh, we could – like our antennas could um, um, receive uh, West German uh, channels, um, the main channels. And uh, of course, I mean, we, we only watched West German television. I mean, if anyone admitted that they were watching, the, the two East German channels were GDR1 and GDR2. Uh, <laughs> and if anyone admitted that they were watching this, it was like, what? God, you're watching 
you're watching Eastern television. Uh, although occasionally there were some nice fairy tale, Russian fairy tale films on there. But yeah, it was just, um, we just watched all the series of the time, you know, C Cold Seavers, uh, uh, Falcon Crest, uh, God, I, you know, anything. Uh, Dynasty, Dynasty, yeah, Dallas, of, of course, it all had different stuff. names in German. Yeah. Um, Dynasty. So it was mainly on, on set, Saturday afternoons, these shows would start. And I mean, everyone was just sitting in front of the telly watching these programs. And then on Monday, we'd talk about it at school. But then, of course, it was illegal. It, it wasn't allowed. And um, I mean, some people would just pull the curtains, uh, you know, you would turn down the volume. And uh, quite often, on mostly on Saturday evenings, around six o'clock or so, you know, the doorbell would ring. And sometimes it was the mayor who, um, uh, you know, I mean, you kind of knew each other anyway. You know, he was local and he knew my father and But they were always kind of, nah, yeah, just stopping by and uh, and then, you know, turn off the television or just turn it over. But then the television, it was an old black and white television. And sometimes, you know, when you change the channels, the picture would kind of only slowly, uh, or when you turned it off, you know, it would very, very slowly uh, um, yeah. just disappear. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like, oh, come on, come on, come on. Uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so you know you couldn't get caught doing that although i mean i'm pretty sure the mayor was also watching west german television um but yeah everybody watched it and um so we as kids we were mostly fascinated of course by um advertising because there was all the stuff that we dreamed of all the time you know all the food all these colorful packages all this oh my god and it looked so great and um you know sometimes we would just wait uh, for advertisements <laughs> to come up so we could, <laughs> we could watch that and just see what niceties they have in the west oh my god yeah but there were some areas in uh in east germany where uh, for example uh in the area of dresden which is very close to um the czech border so the further east you went of course, the less signal you had. And so the area around Dresden was called the uh, Tal der Ahnungslosen, a valley of those who have no idea. <laughs> and um, the, because they, re they, they really had no idea. Because in England, we had an East German TV program shown on English TV called The Singing Ringing oh, Tree. Oh, my God. That's a creepy film. Which was like a fairy tale. It's and creepy. it scared oh the life God. out of me. <laughs> oh, oh yes. so creepy. They showed that on so British creepy. television. Why? <laughs> they showed that on British TV. I don't know. I guess it was cheap. <laughs> to, oh, yes. To get it that in. And, and uh, the child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I mean, th those two are my... Um, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you on both of those. They are, yeah, they would definitely, well, they definitely did give me nightmares. But um, now with your relatives in Germany, how how did you stay in touch with them? Were you writing to them? Um, yes. So we wrote a lot of letters and they would just visit, you know, they, they could visit as often as they wanted. So the ones that lived a little bit closer, although, I mean, living clo living closer didn't really mean that the journey was short, you know, they'd have to go a long way around to the border crossing. And, um, but we wrote letters, postcards, and occasionally um, telegrams for birthdays and so on. Um, just, just to kind of keep in touch. Yeah, we're all fine. We're all safe. Um, but the letters were, of course, opened. Uh, I remember that when my mother, um, so this is something that's not in the book, but um you're probably familiar with that in Berlin, here in Berlin, we have the large uh, Stasi archives where they keep all the files on, on all the East German subjects they, they watched. Um, and my mother applied to have a look at her file and they uh, sent her all the material that they found. And there were some letters in there, which uh, were just the most, I mean, there was really nothing in them, but they had photocopied them. They had a, uh, steamed open the envelope he, they had even made a photocopy of the envelope both sides and then copied the letters and it was really just uh you know normal stuff but um and we thought oh my god they really did read those letters 
But yeah, so lots of letter writing and occasionally phone calls. Um, our next door neighbors, relatives of ours, they had a telephone. No, telephones in East Germany, they were just very rare. So only certain people had a telephone, the mayor, the priest, or anyone else in kind of like a position where you'd have to make a phone call every once in a while. And uh, so our next door neighbor, he was a, um ambulance driver so he, he also had a phone but he wasn't allowed to use it himself he was only allowed to receive calls <laughs> he could make an emergency call that was possible um so my aunt from west berlin i would say maybe once or twice a month on a saturday uh she would call and it was always dark outside and then we could hear my aunt from next door she would be behind the window and you could hear her, Waltraud, Waltraud, that's my mother's name. So kind of this, this Waltraud. <laughs> and we were all, ah, telephone, telephone. Okay. And then we would all run over in our slippers, uh, up the stairs into the small living room and then the telephone. And then my aunt would be on the other line. And it sounded as if she was on Mars. It was, there was so much creaking, so much noise in the line. And, and then, of course, the conversations were very, very short. It was only just, how are you? Yes, great, mm -hmm. good. Are you coming soon? Uh, yeah, we're trying and hang in there and goodbye and, you know. But but these were like, that, that was, I can't even begin to describe to you the excitement when, um, oh, my God, it's a phone call from, from West Berlin. Uh, my mother, I mean, she, she would just, she was always, always in tears afterwards because she always wanted out. She always wanted out. Um, and for her, it was really hard, really hard. How did your relatives get out? Did they get out well before the fence went up in 52 or whenever it was? Yeah. So I can't really, tell, I can't really say for the, um, for the relatives in West Germany on my father's side, uh, I, I know that some of them had already moved over there when there was just the demarcation line, but the border wasn't closed yet because up until, uh, I don't know, 51, 52, I don't want to say any wrong numbers now, but it was just a demarcation line. And then later became a border. But I know that my aunt in West Berlin, she was, so she was living in this town where I was born, Oranienburg, and she was working in the western part of Berlin before the wall was built. And when the wall, so, and then eventually, you know, she moved there. She met her husband and she, she already lived in West Berlin. But what's interesting is, is that the, um, my mother was visiting at the time. She was, uh, 13, 12 or 13. And she was there in West Berlin with my aunt the night the wall was built. So in the morning, my aunt stormed into my mother's room and said, you have to stay here now. They've built the wall. I mean, there were rumors going around, but nobody really believed that it would mm. happen. And my mother was just, she was so happy, you know, she was, cause she loved it there. She loved it, you know, at my aunt's and, but uh, a couple of days later, and she still talks about this with tears in her eyes, uh, a couple of days later, um, now I'm not sure, I think the police came to her house uh, because she was registered as a visitor there and said, you know, she's a minor, she needs to go back to the east. And then they escorted her to the closest border crossing. And then she had to walk over there uh, where my, my grandmother was standing waving and she told me she cried. She walked over there with her little suitcase and she cried and cried and cried. And the East German border guard kind of, you know, took her by the hand. And then he said to her, don't cry. When you're 18, you can go back over. But my aunt, uh, she, she was lucky. And my uncle who's also in West Berlin. He was, uh, his case was such that, he was very much a rebel and uh, he was constantly under scrutiny, uh, constantly brought in for interrogations because he had long hair. He listened to Jimi Hendrix. He was considered um, an antisocial subject. Um, and he had actually planned on escaping together with his best friend. And his plan was to um, escape 
uh, via the so-called green border, which is what the border where I grew up um, by was called because it was very foresty, woody, uh, woody area. And he was on the train. Um, his friend didn't show up. So he got on the train himself and was on his way down to Thüringen. And then at, at a stop somewhere, uh, they came in, into the train and took him out and put him away to prison for, um, cause, cause it turns out his best friend had betrayed him and had told, um, the police about it. And then he was in prison for some time, um, he was also forced to do work in a chemistry factory where he lost his hair, his teeth. Possibly one of the factories where East German prisoners were building stuff for a famous Swedish uh, furniture house. But I, I don't know. That's just my speculation. <laughs> Sorry, I've got one of their bookcases behind <clears throat> yeah, me. Well, we're not it's a bit embarrassing. Any, any, <laughs> but eventually he... So my mother... Um, then and my grandmother, uh, they tried to get him out, of course. And there was this one famous East German lawyer. Well, he was more of a power broker between East and West, um, Vogel, Anwalt Vogel, Herr Vogel. And he was, uh, he was the one lawyer who was always getting the prisoners out of East German prisons. And well, you could say, well, selling them to the West, really. And they went to see him and uh, my grandmother, I remember she was telling me, yeah, oh God, he was such a, such a nice man, such a nice man. And he said, don't worry, we'll get him out. And he got him out. Um, I don't remember what, for what fee. Uh, I think we tried to look this, we tried to find this out, um, but I don't remember. But he was, he was bought free, um, so to speak, and ended up in West Berlin. And um my mother remember, she told me that she remembers when the telegram came from my aunt and all it said was, he's with us. And then they all just broke down. And, um, unfortunately, I, so he, he was allowed to send, uh, one letter a month or so, one page. And I remember that I read them all, um, when my grandmother was still alive. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know where they went. I would love to have them, but that's also something I remember really well. Those letters, which were always completely ins- inconspicuous, of course, and um, but that's how they ended up in the West. Incredible. I mean, Fogel is quite a. I was going to say mm. famous, probably infamous character during the Cold War because he was involved in the that's spy right. exchange of Rudolf Abel and Gary Powers as well. I mean, he features in that film Bridge of Spies with uh, with Tom Hanks. He's got a very flashy yes. sports the car, Golden I think. BMW. In the... <laughs> the I don't know BMW. if that's true, but yeah. this is what – or he drives a golden BMW. No, but... I was kind of – yeah, one of the stories in the book is called The Golden BMW, and it does talk about um, Vogel in there. So I, w- I wanted to um, talk a bit more about your, your your school time. I mean, were the teachers trying to trick you into saying you'd watch West German TV? Because I've heard somewhere that they used to ask kids what the clock looked like when the news was I on. I have not witnessed that being asked, but I know that uh, I'm pretty sure that this happened. I mean, I've heard... Uh, you know, especially in kindergarten, you know, when you're still, you know, you would ask, oh, what does the clock look like? Um, I mean, what what I witnessed more was that, you know, if you brought stuff from the West, that it would be confiscated. You know, if you brought any, I remember one time, like what my, uh, the girl who was sitting next to me, um, she had this little, um, I don't know, they were really popular at the time, Monchichi, kind of like a really ugly, cuddly toy. I don't know if you had them in Britain, but they were apparently really popular in West Germany, kind of like a little... Well, like a cabbage some, patch yes, doll. Yes, something like Was that. It a big something, doll? Just, yeah. just in small. Yeah. No but idea she how I know that, that. And then I remember anyway. the teachers were saying, this is the von Trüm, uh, that's from over there. Give that to me. <laughs> you can't have that here. And I thought, <laughs> what a... Bloody Monchichi, I mean, really? Uh, and she put it in her drawer, which was already full with other, you know, I don't know, stuff. But I think a lot of this was um, ha- probably hadn't so much to do with, uh, you know, 
the whole ideology and this is, but it was more that she was in a bad mood and now she had to kind of sanction us somehow. Um, but then the, the whole tricking part, I think this, this really only came later, you know, when we had this, this particular subject, which was, um, which, which, which this is when things started to get a bit hairy because, um, here you had a subject at school where you were giving grades, you know, you were giving, uh, you know, you, you had to write tests and, uh, do oral tests. And this, this is where discussions would arise. And here's where you had to be careful. I remember that there were, um, sometimes questions in class, you know, uh, um, so, but, but why, why can't we travel over there? Why is that not allowed? I remember that very uh, distinctly that we brought this question up once. And um, and you know what? I can't remember what the teacher said. I, rem I remember who asked that question even. Um, and we were all looking at, uh, at the boy. Um, but I don't remember what the teacher said. But I just know that uh, inwardly, I, I was just always terrified of... Um, saying anything that could compromise somehow myself or my family because my, my biggest fear was that um, my family and I would somehow be separated which which is normal for any child but uh, with me it was very um, clearly that I was always very much watching what I was saying and in this uh, this particular subject I just learned the whole book by heart I mean, I just, um, anything that was written in that book, anything that might have been tested, I just learned it word by word, like a poem. Because I thought if I do that, um, then I feel a little bit better. My, my conscience is a bit clearer because I'm just learning words, but I don't need to believe them. Um, you know, I can just regurgitate so, uh, and I remember that once we were asked to write somehow like an essay, I can't remember, but it was just one of these topics, you know, why is the struggle of the working class, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought, oh God, and I just really, I just wrote anything that I could remember from the book and somehow tied it together. And when the teacher gave us back the test, he kind of said, uh, do you actually believe what you have written? Or, you know, you've just written, you, you've just, re you've just, uh, replicated what's written in the book. You know, you kind of have to use your own words. And I remember saying that, no, sorry, I can't, I can't do that. But that was already, um, at the time when things were in movement, uh, in East Germany, when, uh, when Hungary was beginning, you know, the kind of the, the people were going to Hungary. Then the Prague embassy was being occupied by East Germans. So th this was already when we were moving towards the times uh, where we weren't so much scared. Although um, there was this brief period where they completely closed the borders, I remember. So you couldn't even, um, you couldn't even get to the Czech Republic uh, just like that anymore. Um, that really closed everything off or made it very difficult to, to leave the country. But that was only for, I don't remember that very clearly, but I, I just remember saying that my mother said, so now that they've closed, they're locking us completely and we can't even go to, um, to the Czech Republic anymore. Yeah. Cause you get, you give quite a lovely description of, of taking holidays in Hungary and how, I think you talk about how the atmosphere changes yes. when you oh, cross God. the border. So Hungary, I've actually just come back from Hungary um, because my dad lives there. Um, Hungary was like this kind of bright, <laughs> this bright, uh, light, friendly, warm spot. Uh, um, it, it was very difficult to get um accommodation over there of course but i mean we were would always just camp you know just camp out or find a cheap room somewhere and we would drive there and uh, we'd usually arrive there in the morning with sunrise and it's 
I just remember uh, very, very clearly uh, we were kind of coming over a hill or something and suddenly uh, I would see uh, Lake Balaton, uh, this tremendous lake, and there were all these little sailing boats on it. And I remember that I, I thought at the time that that was the most beautiful, beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And uh, it was warm, you know, it was... Um, the country was really wide. I mean, there are no mountains, no nothing, uh, just a few hills, but you can see really wide. Uh, and th the language sounds kind of, you know, it sounds different. Uh, there's a lot of Western people there. You can buy lots of Western stuff. And it's it's a little bit like being in Italy. Uh, that's what it was like for us. Oh, wonderful place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some really evocative um descriptions in 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 the book there what was a, a typical school day like for you well it would start quite early um oh not so i mean eight o'clock i think that's what it starts now and then i think what was what's probably um <laughs> makes it a bit uh, special or specific east german is that um when the teacher came in we'd all have to stand up and then um, there was always, so there were all these duties, yeah, amongst uh, everyone had had a duty in class. And then we would have the um, uh, Meldedienst. Um, uh, how would I translate this into English? Uh, greeting duty. <laughs> duty. So, uh, so one student <laughs> would stand in front and kind of look out when the teacher's coming. So as soon as the teacher walks in, the student would say, uh, I'll say it in German first because it probably rings a bit more. Uh, Klasse 5a stillgestanden. So class 5a, stand straight. <laughs> stand still, stand still. <laughs> and then we would really all just, you know, hands on the side. Yes. Like stand, stand at, at attention. attention with at your, attention. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then and mm -hmm. not, nobody said a word. And then the teacher would come in and stand next to this greetings officer, whatever, attention officer. And then, uh, <laughs> then we would have to, then they would turn towards each other. Um, it's a pity the listeners can't see this now, but they would turn towards each other. And then, so the, the attention officer would do the pioneer's greeting, which is this kind of shark fin over your head, uh, closed hand over your head, uh, and say, Herr, bla bla, ich melde, Klasse 5a ist vollständig zum Unterricht angetreten, keiner fehlt. Um, Mr. So-and-so, uh, I'm telling you that Class 5a is ready for the class, no one's missing. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this is just so... Uh, and, and then they would turn towards the class, and then... Um, the greeting, so the the more liberal teachers would just say good morning, and everybody would say good morning. But the more um, in line with the government would say friendship. That was our official greeting, friendship, and then everybody would go friendship. <laughs> <laughs> and in Russian, it would all have to be done in Russian, of course. So it, it was. Uh, yeah, so that, that is quite particular. Um, and then, wow. yeah, we had, so, so, yeah, and then lessons would start. And I mean, the lessons were just quite, you know, like today only that it was, of course, frontal. You know, it was, there was no project work. There was no group work. It was all just kind of, you know, you're sitting there looking at the teacher. He's asking questions. You're raising your hand. It's all about right, wrong, good, bad. You're getting, uh, a good mark you're getting a bad mark it, it wasn't as as today you know as as quite you know f or free work that was just non-existent you know it was always frontal although my dad um my father he always tried a little bit of a different approach he tried to read different books with the students but he was constantly getting into trouble uh for this and um yeah uh, he would often just improvise, but mostly it was like, you know, tuck, 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 that's the plan. And this is what we follow. There's no extras. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you would stand again to attention and then either goodbye or friendship. 
So, uh, and then we just, uh, and then we had the lunch, of course. And then afterwards, um, some kids went home, but most kids had to go to this after school, uh, activity, which is also something we still have in Germany. But back in the day, it was, um, well, it was compulsory. Um, if you didn't want to go there, like I, I didn't want to go there to the afternoon, um, afternoon activities uh you'd have to be like officially excused and it was very problematic because all this was of course to make us into good citizens it, it wasn't really to and i know a lot of east germans might contradict me and say yeah but it was great we were playing and it's true we were playing but it was always under the um umbrella of the ideology um so we had various activities but it was like young historians young agitators um young uh, uh ambulance helpers uh, yeah stuff like that and yeah because you d you describe in in the book an interesting uh sports activity where you're given yes. something to throw Sorry, folks, you'll have to wait for next week's episode for more of Claudia's story of her life right up against the inner German border. Her book is called Nevermind Comrade by Claudia Beershank. It's published by Tangerine Press and there's links available in the episode notes. There are photos and videos illustrating this episode in our episode notes. Look for the link in the podcast information. Now, this podcast would not exist without our financial supporters, and I want to thank one and all of them for their generous support. If you want to help us, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>